Welcome to episode 97 of On the Track, which is a show about cryptozoology, animal welfare, conservation, surreality, and all sorts of other nonsense that we make up as we go along. Wahey! <laughs> As regular viewers of this show will remember, I recently started to foster the career of Wally the Comedy Rhinoceros, a very talented young quadruped who I believe is one of the greatest stand-up comedians of his or any other generation. However, neither Charlotte or Karina are as enamoured with this young rhino as I am. I'm going to get that pesky rhino once and for all. Poor Wally. Charlotte's chased him outside of the gates and it doesn't look like he'll ever be able to get in again. Girls can be so cruel sometimes. Hi there, my name's John Downs. My name's Charlotte Phillipson. And welcome to another episode of On The Track. Oh, it's that bloody rhinoceros again! Eek. Britain is a small country off the northwest coast of Europe, and we are rapidly destroying what is left of our wildlife. Places like this, for example, where John used to explore and study nature as a boy, used to be teeming with wildlife, but no longer. These ditches alongside of the road used to each be a little world of its own, but no more. The water table is compromised, and they get more and more polluted each year. But it's not all bad news. There are still quite a few animals that do live here in the United Kingdom. One of the things that I find most interesting about cryptozoology is that it is not just the search for mysterious animals from prehistory which may or may not have survived, but it is also the search for creatures which have become extinct far more recently, or should I say have been assumed to have become extinct. Because even in a country as well explored and as overpopulated as 21st century Britain, there are still quite important and sizable animal mysteries to be solved. So what are these? These are pine martins. Uh, they are extremely rare terrestrial mammals from Britain, uh, second only to the Scottish wildcat. They are mustelids, uh, so they are related to weasels and stoats, as you can tell by the slim nature of their anatomy. And uh, I got both of these from a car boot sale, from two different car boot sales in the Midlands. And it was just interesting how varied they actually are. Even if this is a female and this is a male, there is extreme difference between the two. I've never seen these at uh, car boot sale around here though. No, you don't really see them down here, I think. I, uh, I found these, both of these, in the West Midlands. And um, they're relatively common there. I see them pretty much every time I go to a car boot sale. They're always sun faded like this. Um, this one's not quite so bad, this one's still got a bit of pigmentation, but usually they're in this sort of condition and they're quite cheap to pick up. Pine martins have always been animals with a very special place in my heart, because back in the mid-1990s when I started the Centre for Fortune Zoology, one of my first ever research projects was following up eyewitness accounts which did appear to show that pine martins, which were supposed to have become extinct in nearly all of England in the late 19th century, had actually survived. I presented my findings to several eminent mammal experts in the United Kingdom, but none of them were interested in what I had to say. 
And I wrote about this in my book, Small and Mystery of Carnivores of the West Country, which was published first in 1996. Roll on a decade or so, and I was very gratified when English Nature announced that they had found relict populations of pine martins in several English counties, including ones in the south of England, although, ironically, they hadn't found any colonies in the places where I had predicted that they would be found. So, I was particularly interested when Carl Marshall told me that he and his father had seen what he thought was a pine martin only a few years ago, in Carl's native Midlands. Um, so I went into Oversley Wood with my father. We do this every couple of weeks or so. We just go for a walk around and see what we can see. And this particular time, uh, there was a commotion in the trees about 100 yards away from where we were. And I saw quite clearly... Uh, a predatory, a small predatory mammal chasing a squirrel down a tree, um, directly down towards the ground, and it sort of ran round the side and then back up the opposite side of the tree out of sight. I could see quite clearly that it was about twice the size of a squirrel, of the squirrel it was chasing, and it was very dark in colour. I could see a difference in the colour between the squirrel and the predator. If it was a squirrel that was chasing another squirrel, it would have been absolutely enormous and melanistic. My father heard the commotion and he did see something but he wouldn't um, commit to saying it was a martin. But I saw it quite, I saw it more clearly and uh, I, I believe it was a martin. In fact I contacted the Vincent Wildlife Trust about it. They said to me that it was an interesting report um, but there had been no other eyewitness reports of that nature in that forest so they would put it on file uh, waiting for further developments. I've got a job for you. Does it involve dead bodies? I think it might. Yay! And Carl explained to Charlotte that what we want her to do is to examine these two stuffed animals very closely and to take detailed measurements. So we can actually tell, for example, what percentage of the entire body length is taken up by tail in each particular creature and for example what percentage of the size of the feet of each of these animals was taken up by each of the toes. The two animals are very different and we are wondering as we have told Charlotte whether these are differences in sexual morphology or even in age of the creature but what we haven't told Charlotte is that there is a very real possibility that one of them might be an entirely new species for Britain. And you're going to have to wait until next time to find out more. But meantime, let's get on to some music. As regular viewers will remember, my mate Steve Andrews recently released a song about plastic pollution and his song has been heard all over the world and is making quite a few waves. Plastic plants, what about real plants? I saw the fake ones at the store. People must want them, people must buy them. I don't want to see any more. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea. How does it get there? Who threw it away? And it got me thinking, I took it as a call to arms, because I've been making music ever since I was a teenager. But bizarrely, although I've been an ecological activist for many years, I've never actually written a song on the subject. So I decided I was going to write something, but what was I going to write? Then, a couple of weeks ago, the United Nations announced something which we all knew already, that we've only got 12 more years to even slightly reverse all the damage that we have done to the ecosystem and possibly avoid what papers are beginning to call ecogeddon. And those 12 years have got me thinking even more. My granddaughter Evelyn is four years old and in 12 years time she'll be the same sort of age as some of the magnificent young women who are spearheading climate change protests all around the world. And so I wrote this. And I want to dedicate this song with love, not only to my granddaughter Evelyn, but to all the young people 
who are taking to the streets and taking on the might of the oppressive governments around the world who seem to be doing their best to destroy our planet. Cop it over this.
Hello, my pretties. I saw something nasty in my suit session today. It looked a bit like a desiccated moth to me. Not quite as good as a desiccated bit of coconut, but desiccated moth is not good at all, I don't think. Anyway, on the show. What about Lake Muncie's granddad? This next bit of footage is copyrighted material and we are using it under the doctrine of fair use. Because it is of serious scientific interest if it is true and if, as we believe, it's a hoax, the people don't deserve to be able to insist on the rights of copyright holders. Well, Charlotte, it seems like every episode we're doing this now and critiquing YouTube videos of strange water monsters, but I think this one's the weirdest yet. Martin Eve, who, you know, used to live in the village and then moved back to Wales, sent me this video yesterday. And one of the weirdest things about it isn't just that it's a strange video, which does appear to be showing all sorts of strange creatures in it, but the rest of the things on this YouTube channel are all documentaries about Islam or about Islamic phenomena and I find this all really strange. Look at this. Strange creatures caught on video. Exploring a small chain of islands. What on earth do you think of this? I don't know, it looks, it feels very sort of fake. Feels very fake. Yesterday, Carl Marshall told me that he thought it looked like Mr. and Mrs. Beaver from the old BBC adaptation of Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And then he went on to say they looked like a spineless hedgehogs. They kind of look like puppets from sort of the labyrinth and Dark Crystal. They're not that good. Well, I know, but <laughs> they give off that sort of impression. It was the first thing that popped into mind when I saw them. And the other thing which I think is peculiar is it's talking about tribes of cannibals living on these remote islands, but it doesn't say anything about where the islands are. Yeah, that is very, it feels very staged, that. Yeah. And... I've got no idea what they are. I think they can, I think, like you said, they are the puppets of the people in costume. According to a member of the tour, locals refer to these creatures as China, which roughly translates to waterman in English. But again, locals where? I've never heard of these things ever. Somebody's obviously been to quite a lot of um, effort to do this because what are the seven, eight of these things? Mm. And it's quite, they've done to quite an effort because they all seem to be moving, so they're not models. So then there's going to be seven or eight people all in reasonably homogenous costumes wandering about. I'm sure it's a fake. But it's a very good one. Share this around and show the world. Well, yeah, we're just about to, but probably not with the comments that they wanted us to. Now, boys now and girls, boys and what do we have here? And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On the Track product placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. 
and now each episode we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned films. Back in the days of the Wild West, they always used to say that the Pony Express might be late, but it always got through. And that's something I like to say about the Centre for Fortune Zoology. Life gets in the way, but we always get there in the end. And I'm very pleased to say that we've just released our latest double issue of Animals and Men, our journal which has been going since 1994. This latest issue features Richard, Chris Clark and Dave Archer in Tajikistan in search of the ghoul. It also features Lars and Linda in the wilds of Denmark where they actually find out that everything the people thought they knew about earwigs in the small Scandinavian country was actually wrong. And we have the first part of an A to Z of lesser known mystery animals by our very own Carl Marshall. And there are book reviews, news, CFZ news and all sorts of other odds and sods as well as letters from the editor and, well, all sorts of other things. You want to know about what's in there? Well, go and check it out. It's free. And now it is time to go over to the lovely Corina and this month's episode of The Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird, a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have, and that's what this segment from the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. Well, hello. I have a new cue card girl. It's my mother. Say hello, mother. To the camera, mother. Just say hello. Hello. That was very definitive, wasn't it? Poor Charlotte has, um, he's not very well. So, you know, she's got a coldy, chesty, coffee.
bright pink with black feathers that really into winter months like colours faded. Last year about 200 bird watchers gathered in large flock close to the street to get a picture of another rose coloured starling. Three calls. My father wrote a dictionary of Devonshire dialect, but Karina isn't from around these parts, which is why she doesn't know that the place name spelt Yelmton is actually pronounced Yampton, which you'd know if you were Devonshire dumpling. A rare albino pheasant was spotted in a field near Yelmton in Devon recently. The sighting of which is prompted one of the experts to say that it hasn't seen anything like it in 60 years. Let's just hope its reported rareness does not mean, wait for it, does not mean that a pheasant plucker or a pheasant plucker's son will think that it's fair game. Luckily, I said that A number of strange new fish have been described from Australian waters. An undescribed species of the frogfish 
genus Histiophorine has been described on the basis of 60 specimens collected from shallow inshore waters of Western and South Australia. Previously confused with this morphologically similar congena H. cryptocanthus, it differs from the latter and from all other members of the genus in having a distinct combination of features. A taxonomic review of species of the Indo-Pacific batfish genus Halcometus, occurring in the Australian Exclusive Economic Zone has taken place, resulting in a reclassification of the poorly known H. marmoratus and descriptions of two new species, Halcometus westraliensis, an Australian endemic, and H. drypus from the northern sector of the Australian Exclusive Economic Zone off Norfolk Island. The Australian species can be distinguished from each other and regional congeners by a combination of morphometrics, meristics and coloration. Megophorus are a group of morphologically conserved, primarily forest-dependent frogs known to harbour cryptic species diversity. Populations of small-sized megophorus from mid and high elevation locations in the Huang Lien range in northern Vietnam have recently been examined. On the basis of morphological, molecular and bioacoustic data, individuals of these populations differed from all other species of megophorus known from mainland Southeast Asia and from provinces in neighbouring China. Further, the newly collected species formed two distinct species level groups. They have been described as Megophrys fancia penis and Megophrys honglangiensis. Both new species are range restricted and likely to be highly threatened by habitat degradation. These discoveries highlight the importance of the Hoang Lien range for Vietnam's amphibious diversity. A new species of a lapid snake of the genus Microurus or coral snakes is described from the states of Rondonia and Mato Grosso in the western Brazilian Amazon. The new species has a single anal plate, a unique characteristic shared with members of the M. hemprici species group. It can be distinguished from the other members of this group by having a parietal reddish band in juveniles, absent in adults, and the absence of brownish or orange-yellow dorsal body bands. In addition, this species is distinguished from M. hembrici by its lower number of body triads and from M. ortoni by its lower numbers of ventral and subcortal scales. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. Say hello to the Dracula Annal. A new species of unnoticed lizard from the Andean slopes of southwestern Colombia and northwestern Ecuador from between 1187 and 2353 meter in elevation has been described. The new species can be distinguished from other anolis in squamation, crail os cranial osteology, hemipenal morphology and nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. The new species is sister to Anolis equatorialis and has been suggested that previous records of A. equatorialis in Colombia correspond to this new species. Sadly, the specific name Anolis dracula does not claim that the new species is an evil member of the undead, but instead refers to the Dracula Reserve located within the distribution of the new species and to near its type locality. The Dracula Reserve is an initiative of the eco Foundation, sponsored by the Orchid Conservation Alliance, Rainforest Trust, University of Basel Botanic Garden and their individual donors. The reserve protects an area with a high diversity of orchids of the genus Dracula. Meanwhile, in Anolis news, the brown anole, which is a highly invasive species native to Cuba and the Bahamas, which has already spread to Florida and as far north in the United States as southern Georgia, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Hawaii and California, has been found on Ascension Island for the first time. Ascension Island is an isolated volcanic island on the South Atlantic Ocean. It's about 1,600 kilometres from the coast of Africa and 2,250 kilometres from the coast of Brazil. It's been a British territory since 1815 when the British garrisoned it as a precaution after imprisoning Napoleon on St Helena to the southeast. A newly discovered population of parachute geckos 
from the Mount Popa volcano, a habitat island in the northern portion of the Baga Yoma Mountains, Myanmar, is a new species, Phytozoon popensi. This species is part of a clade that contains P. bananensi and P. leototum. This discovery highlights the unique insular nature of the Bagoyoma Mountains of the Irrawaddy Basin, which support other endemic geconids. It also underscores the growing diversity in this highly derived clade of cryptid parachuting geckos, characterised by highly divergent genetic lineages, which may well indicate the presence of additional unrecognised species. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. But first, there's this, and in next month's episode... Well, we're still hoping to bring you the story of Max and the Sturgeon in Russia, like we've been promising you for the last couple of episodes. But one thing which we know we have here is what happened when Charlotte went to Jersey and solved a little mystery I've been wondering about for many years. And now there's this. Ever since we restarted this show back in the summer, we've been telling you how Louis was going to set up a Patreon campaign. Well, he's done it. And you can come, see what he's done, and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address. Thank you, guys. And now, over to Charlotte in Heartland. Thank you for watching this month's episode and we hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to click that like button to subscribe as well as clicking the notification bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video. Make sure to share this video on social media as well as following our Facebook page. Thank you and goodbye! Well that's about it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to say thank you for all the people who helped this time around. And a big thank you to everybody who supports us, not just by watching this show, just by helping with the kind of support and theology in a wider and regular basis. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for what you do, because we truly didn't be able to do it without you. I don't believe this year is going so quickly. The next episode is actually going to be the last one of the year. But what's going to be in it? We're just going to have to wait to find out. We'll see you.